everybody. <laughs> um, I think we're going to start now. Um, so I'm just going to briefly introduce myself. My name is Andrea Emilife. I'm a curator and an art historian. Um, and I'm joined by two incredible artists. I have Shola Ololode and I've got Joy Yamasangi. And today we'll be discussing their practice. Um, we'll be talking about figurative painting, um, being an artist in, um, currently, and all sorts of things. So I am going to start um, with a very direct question. Um, I wanted to ask both of you, what brings you to figurative painting? And can you tell us a little bit about your creative practice? So either one of you can start. Um, I guess I always, when I f was interested in art and first starting painting, I always painted people. I was always mm, drawing like faces, eyes, like bodies, um, people interacting with each other. Um, I was just drawn to that immediately um, when I first started doing art, I guess. Painting objects or abstract didn't like have a narrative for me. I wanted to tell like stories and communicate um, using um, figures. Um, when I first started art, I was very interested in just drawing like flesh and features. And I guess the way I kind of, the artists that I was looking at were kind of like, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio, the like pre Raphaelites, and I was like obsessed with that kind of like um, painting and the, the way that they told stories and like captured people. Um, so I think those early influences then drew me in wanting to be a big painter. That's such a big question. So I'm going to do like a short of that. Um, I studied illustration and I think part of that was just storytelling, um, reading lots of books, that kind of thing. So I think I've always wanted my work to tell some kind of story or to be part of a big series that tells some kind of fiction. Um, so I'm interested in, well, I love illustration. Um, I'm in people and faces, but most of the time my work is just and my face. <laughs> so yeah. I forgot what the first half and, of that um, was. Yeah, to so the second part, what, how would you sort of describe um, the way that you approach figuration? As you were saying, that, I mean, figures have existed throughout art history and they've um, manifested in so many different ways, but both of you have such strong visual languages. And I would love to hear from your own words how you would describe your way of um, painting the figure. Um, so when I was in college, I remember my would always do this exercise with like line drawing. So you have the mirror in front of you, you don't look at the page, just your face. We would always do that as a warm up. And it's something so simple, but that I'll draw now. Or I kind of look at the page, but it's different. I try and draw every one line, understanding that like uh, figurative painting could be quite broad. Um, so yeah, I just, I feel like it's quite like a loose way of doing it but um, that's my approach to it i'd say my approach is my interest i guess early, very early on in like university was like capturing movement and like expression i wanted to always capture like an interaction and people like doing being active like either like embracing or like you know my first series of work was about dancing so i guess it's kind of kind of being free with material to like show the kind of energy and like coming together, moving, being expressive with their body. And touching on that, I feel like figuration as a, as a style can, is so intertwined with um, narrative ideals. Um, when you're painting figures, you can um, assume different narratives, different situations. It might draw from memory or it might be um, more of imagination and trying to figure out what might be. Um, I wondered how you form your narratives, um, what sort of inspirations um, create those narratives for the figures? Is it from your family? Is it from the past? Or is it, um, you know, imagined lives? Um, for me, it's like a bit of everything. Some of it is like a lot, I would say it's like 50-50 imagination and like found imagery, like other artists' work that I get influenced by. A lot of photography, music videos and film, I'll just like see a scene and be like, I want to recreate that um, in like my painting style. Um, and other, other times, like, I have an image in my head of how I want two figures or multiple figures to interact. And I might piece together 
uh, different images that I might see or just kind of like create a scene. Um, I guess when I'm doing that, I've, I never wanted it to be like too personal, my work. Um, so I liked having that distance of like other people's images and like it's from my imagination, it's not necessarily me, even though people look at the work and they're like, that looks like you and <laughs> so and so. But um, now actually more recently, I'm starting to like use images from like when I've been traveling and like personal images and like my friends and family, the way they kind of interact and trying to bring that into the work. I think mine is like a similar percentage, but I'd probably say 60% imagination and then the rest coming from real experiences. So I, I do get inspired by the people around me and my family, um, but the rest, like I daydream a lot. I love just writing down my dreams when I wake up or like voice notes, like a lot of it is just imagined and made up. And so like the last exhibition I had was um, an imaginary jazz club, just something that I had in a dream, as you do. Um, but then thinking about, like I still reference real life things like he said about like you see some paintings or like a photo and you're like, oh, this thing is interesting, but I like that I can just make up whatever I want and have it how I want to have it. Yeah, I feel like I do that because even if I'm like looking at another image, I will still like change the face and yeah, change the features yeah. um, into like how it, I want it to fit into my. And image. sometimes like you can even like mix in, like he said, with like people that you know and drawing, incorporating them into the work. So sometimes I'll have a conversation with a friend and that finds its way into the <laughs> artwork, and I feel like, oh, this is really familiar. But um, I think that's kind of nice actually for it to be a mix of those two worlds. Yeah, and actually a lot of mine is um, like stock footage. I spend a lot of time like... Oh wow, I, didn't, I wouldn't have assumed that. Yeah, I, <laughs> I just... thought it was all you. <laughs> no, I Google like... Um, like Friends. Uh, queer, <laughs> no, like queer couple sitting on a bench or right. like, um, like black what couple... What is the stock like, imagery like, like for that? <laughs> it's very hard to find a right. lot of imagery. So that's why also I end up like changing the way that people actually look like in the images that I found. Um, but yeah, a lot of it is just like literally Google image search, like jetty images or something. But do you ever also like recreate the pictures yourself, like get your friends to do it, like to sit um, on a bench and then? I kind of intend, I mean, this year there was one painting, actually I started a painting, it was like a scene of a couple, um, like having like a picnic date. And then I was on this date um, earlier in the year and we were having a picnic and I was like, oh. Can I, Wait, I did it. Can I, I was like, can I um, take a photo of us? Because I need to get the positioning of the 40 years correct. It was in the first day. <laughs> so the second? <laughs> um, yeah, so that's like the first painting, I guess, I've made where it's like an actual real life scene that I had. Um, otherwise, yeah, I kind of just like try and just imagine how it is. So if you look at the bodies, you're like, that's not actually how a leg should probably be bending, but... Um, I've just been like, oh, I'll I make it work. Portions of what doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. In your paintings. No, you know, not, in, <laughs> not in my style of Legs work. Legs can it? bend whatever way yeah. they might fancy. Yeah. <laughs> I think most of the time I'm drawing people and like they're looking like this way because I just can't do that in between angle. It doesn't matter. You can just do what you want. So mm -hmm. I like the fun in that. So. Um, listening to you both talk about um, how you create uh, your images and your narratives, um, I can definitely see that there's this is it's quite must be quite difficult not to impart all of your identity or impart like quite a lot of your personal into the work, especially when you're dealing with figuration. So I wanted to ask, um, how does your identity inform your practice and what you choose to depict or what you choose to um, remove or what sort of ambiguities you seek to put into the work? Um, I guess as an artist, it must be quite difficult to not, it, it must just manifest on its own. Mm -hmm. I guess, yeah, like, I don't want the work to be, like, autobiographical. I don't even know how to say that Autobiographical. <laughs> autobiographical. <laughs> um, um, so that's why I'm, like, changing the faces and features and stuff, things like that. But um, I guess I s paint the things that, like, I want to see in the world. And that a lot of that is, like, I've specifically, like, made the conscious decision to, like, only paint black and brown people and mm -hmm. only paint queer and women and non-binary people because those are the like identities of myself and like my community my friends and family and so mm -hmm. i can only paint what i relate to and what i experience um 
So that's kind of how, like, the boundaries that I've set for my work currently anyway. Um, but, yeah, I didn't want it to be, like, I'm telling my life story um, mm -hmm. in the work. I just wanted it to be, like, this is what I experience in life and what I want to experience more of and I want more people to, like, also witness. Um, I think when I'm making my work, I don't have that much of a filter. <laughs> right. So <laughs> I, I think when, I, when I'm in the process of making, then I, I, I can be quite, like, honest and open about it. Um, and the artworks that are really personal, um, that are really, really deeply personal, just, I, just nobody sees that. Right. Um, but the ones that I do feel okay sharing are usually the ones that like without text, because then like they can be interpreted in, in a whole bunch of ways. And actually it doesn't matter what I say this is, somebody's is gonna, somebody else will look at it and see something else. So I don't even think viewers will see um, the original personal story, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I feel okay sharing um, work that is about my life and all of it is about my life so and what message um would you or maybe do you are you consciously thinking about what message um the viewers are getting from the work like you spoke a little bit about um trying to fill in some of the gaps of representation in art or in general in visual culture is that one of the things that you hope that people um are acknowledge when they see the work or are there other sort of messages that you hope that people or even maybe not messages feelings um or stories that you think th that you hope that resonates with the viewers i think yeah i think the representation representation part of it is that i hope that you know people walk into a gallery and be like oh my god that looks like me mm -hmm. that reminds me of me and my partner um and they kind of connect to the work in that way and it makes them like feel nice and then the other part of it is I just hope people connect with the work on a broader level of like the love and the joy like I always want people to walk into a gallery space where my work is and like feel the emotions that the figures are like um, experiencing like radiate and be like oh that love I remember like no matter what background you are and what identities you are they can just feel the emotions um, I think that's kind of what I want from the audience when I'm sharing it if it's I just want to you know, get an emotive response um, from people, even if they hate it. Like, <laughs> it just kind of be like, oh, you know. <laughs> Actually, I think I feel the same. That I just want somebody to feel something if they're looking at the work, like just to have some kind of feeling about it. But I also agree that feeling seen is mm -hmm. probably the main message. Mm -hmm. I think um, when I first had like an exhibition, I remember someone coming up to up to me and saying that that like portrait looked like them um which like it wasn't as of me <laughs> but it's nice that someone could see themselves in in that and i wish that i had that growing up that i could walk into a gallery and see uh, pictures of people who look like me of like black characters trans characters like i didn't see that actually mm -hmm. and so i think i want other black trans people to see that Thinking on the um, materiality of your work, um, Joy, your use of paint and illustration and collage, and Shola, your use of paint of, um, and textile in influenced by Adire um, fabrics, I wondered um, how you go about, about deciding on your techniques and how that is infused um, into the ideas of the work and how linked they are. Um, I guess with the Adire, which is a, like a Nigerian textile, that's indigo, um, which a lot of my work is influenced by when you see the blue works. Um, I think that, for me, when I discovered that material and I started dyeing and using indigo, that was about fusing a part of my Nigerian heritage into the work. Um, and then that just led to like a really fun exploration of material, because previous to that, I was just doing very like traditional oil painting, like mm -hmm. just, you know, priming oil paint blah 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 but I was like okay now I'm dyeing the canvas I'm using resistance dyeing methods like batik um so it's mixed media now and then that was like okay so now I can use pastels and mm. um charcoal and just like chuck all materials um into it and I guess because my themes are so like simple like I you know I had a series that was about dancing a series about love and it's I'm kind of repeating a lot of the same scenes so like for me the experiment with the material is like the fun part and what I'm thinking about when I'm creating the work um, because I've already decided like the kind of what it's gonna look like in terms of the scene. Um, I love experimenting with materials and, but I think that 
when I look at my work from like an overhead view, um, it just reflects what I've had access to. Right. So my wo early work was always like collages and paper because that's all I had like financially <laughs> that I could get. So I was reusing a lot of like materials like cardboard and envelopes and whatever I could find. And then with time when I've been able to uh, buy like some more paints or um, my work now is more like slightly bigger paintings on canvas, but I don't like, I don't stretch them because well, my studio was so small, I didn't have the space. So by making them unstretched, I could just roll them up and store them. So the materials are usually just a reflection of my studio space and uh, budget. <laughs> so I try and experiment with what I can, um, with what I have access to. Do you think the um, limited materials allowed you to push um, yourself into different um, styles, perhaps? Or how did that um, impact on the way that you translate your narrative? Um, not styles, because I feel like my style always is still like very like colourful, but um, it does look different every time with the material. I mean, if I had like the dream budget, I'd be like screen printing every day in my own mm -hmm. massive screen printing studio. <laughs> um, but I, I, I think that it's it's kind of it's inevitable that it would just have an impact on the kind of work that you're making. Like you, I would make big paintings if I had big painting space, but I don't. Um, but yeah, I still try and experiment what I, with what I have um, and just see how it goes. And do you have a, because I've seen you work in so many different mediums, is there one that sort of sings to you most or is it very much about the story that you're, about, you're trying to tell? Like how do you flip between the two? Because I know you were saying you're also embodying a new part, body of work, like so there's a little bit of a dance between mediums happening at the moment. Um. I enjoy the experimentation and like I feel like I have so many series that are like up in my head and so many different ways of like expressing like I feel like because each work is like an experiment in itself each painting I don't do a lot of like preparatory studies beforehand so when I'm doing a painting I'm always trying a different technique um, and sometimes I worry about the like cohesiveness of my practice um, sorry what was the question again? I can't remember. And just like how the material sort of changes for what your um, <sighs> ideas are. But, or if there's a, one that you just feel m more attached to. I actually still really love just like basic oil painting. Oh, wow. And sometimes I want to like return to that and just yeah. like just paint. Because I, when I first started with dyeing and batik, it was actually, it was supposed to be a shortcut. I wanted to, um, <laughs> I wanted to have, um, a blue ground and I was fed up of like always painting the background blue mm -hmm. so I was like oh, I'll just dye the canvas um, and that'll be easier and then it just led off into this tangent <laughs> um, and sometimes I'm just like oh this is long doing this whole <laughs> process I just want to like buy a canvas stretch it and just paint start yeah. painting um, so one day I'm like in the back of my head I'm gonna allow myself to like um, do that kind of thing in a series but I I love I love it all I love all the experiments um, all the different mediums. Um, also, like you say, I would love to like do printing and screen printing. Like my dream one. Oh, so, so much fun. So much. Get involved and do like an etching course and a screen printing oh, course. You should. We should do it. Yeah, yeah it sounds together. fun. Yeah. <laughs> I actually, I think I love. Um, I used to really, really love screen printing when I was studying. Um, but the one thing that I always couldn't get was like the letter, the lettering. You know, with like because oh, you have to flip you have it. To flip it <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And like, there was one time, this print that I made, and um, uh, I was trying to write the word gender underneath it, and every time I'd print it, it would say gender, and I couldn't work oh, no. out what was going wrong. Because <laughs> I did get the letter from the right slot, um, and then I just was like ready to go, and then I just printed it anyway, and people were like, oh, what is the meaning of gender? That's so clever. Like, <laughs> and I was thinking like, yeah, sure. <laughs> it's like an accident, but a happy accident. So. I remember that. Yeah, it was yeah. complete accident. <laughs> I didn't realize that. Yeah, because I used to love, when I did my foundation, I would always be in the screen printing room, and I loved experiment, but I didn't get the chance to do that on my BA course, because it was a painting course, and there wasn't like crossover mm. between the different fine art subjects. So it's always been on like my list of things to do, to like return to. Um. Um, I've got lots of more questions, but I just wanted to pause and see if there's any questions in the audience. Um, and then I might go back to what I'm thinking. You have to be shy. Okay. <laughs> There's one at the front. Uh, my question's for Shola, and I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about 
the use of blue in your work? I know you mentioned um, the indigo dye, but what um, blue means to you in terms of how it links to the emotions that you try to translate in your work? Um, I guess when I first started using blue, it was about just like a purely aesthetic reason. I love the way like blue complemented like black and brown skin tones. Um, and then because I was working on this series of work that was about nightlife and clubbing, I was like, oh, it's like kind of like the blue light of like when you're in the club of like all midnight skies or just like, you know, like club lighting of like, you know, just like spotlights and things like that. Um, and then I guess once I started like researching more into the color blue, I liked its connection, I guess, with the Adiri and the history of indigo. And then it like just, just black painters in general, like there's always this kind of like relationship with the color blue. Um, and I loved the film Moonlight at the time. And I loved that quote in Moonlight, black boys look blue. And I just, it just repeats itself um, for me in like practice and like other artists work. Um, and now, like, when I'm working on this romance series, um, I guess for me, it's still, like, I think that's association with, like, blue being, like, a color of, like, um, depression and the blues. I've never seen it as that for me. For me, it's, like, a nice, warm, like, yeah, it can be very, quite joyful for me. And I think when I first approached the romance series, I wanted it to just be purely, like, yellow and this, like, intense yellow of... Um, falling in love and feeling like sunshine and everything, but I kept returning to blue. Um, it was still came, became apparent, and I remember I was listening to this like red table talk, and they were talking about how they had, I can't remember the specific quote, but they were like talking about how like you know people think love looks like red, um, but actually it's blue. And I was like struggling with dyeing my um, canvas yellow at the time, and I was like. Oh, actually it's blue and the blue is still going to be like apparent in the work um so that's why yeah that's what it kind of means um joy how about you talk about how color informs um your work um i actually think we're quite similar in the tense in the, in the sense that we are like go through like strong color phases <laughs> yeah. um i think mine at the moment is like lilac and red and before mm -hmm. that it was red and I think every so often it's like another color and then it's red again. Um, I think I just love color. And when I was in, when I was studying, I used to just work exclusively in black and white. And I think it's just because I wasn't that happy at that time. And then after that, I just, I just loved using color. I just felt like happier. And um, when I look at like family photos and everyone's just like fully dressed in bright, colorful outfits and like, got a lot of my inspiration from that. So yeah, I don't shy away from it. But I think I center around the same three colors, which is like red, yellow, and blue, the primary colors, primary basically. Colors. <laughs> you can't go wrong with, learned. you can't go wrong with those colors. Remember the so. color wheel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can't go wrong with them. Um, any other questions? Uh, perhaps I do one last question. I wanted to ask um, about your relationship with more, the more sort of traditional figurative works and how you sort of relate to art history or see yourself in the sort of greater land, landscape of, um, of figuration and what are you trying to, um, I guess, maybe disrupt or what, do you, what sort of artists um, do you look up to as well? Yeah, I guess, like, as I said, like, the, I guess how I, like, trained as an artist and, like, the artist that I first looked at in, like, secondary school and um, went at university, well, the kind of, like, the, the traditional oil painters and that kind of, like, is what drew me in. So that I'm always kind of in conversation with them, mm -hmm. I would say, especially as I do love still using the oil paint. And, but it's, like, I want to do my own spin on it by bringing different materials and, like, a different narrative that has not been seen in like Western art histories. Um, so I'm trying to like, I guess, do my own version of it. <laughs> I think that it's been like an essential part of my work at the beginning. Like you said, like I, we study that in school, so I just can't like ignore all of that. Mm -hmm. um, now, I don't think I tune into it so much, mm -hmm. but I, what I do like mostly about it is the like composition and the, with a lot of those paintings they're just so dramatic and mm. I love the drama of them 
you know, you have people just like spilling out onto the floor or somebody's just like crying and wailing and I love all, I love all of it actually. So, yeah. Yeah, it's funny that you say that about, yeah, because I realize that I kind of left that in, in behind and now I'm like trying to like re-educate myself. So I only really like look at black artists now, like yeah. very just like I only go to black artist shows and like POC shows because I'm trying to like fill in the blanks of and what am I. And the legacy that you're part of. Yeah, I feel like my education kind of like failed me and now I'm trying to like find all these artists that were kind of like either like buried or not neglected in the past and like learn about them and now like, you know, celebrate who's, you know, like exhibiting now. Um, and so to finish off, what is your dream project and um, what can we look forward to coming up soon, I guess, for the end of the year, so coming up next year, maybe? Dream project, exhibition at the Tate. artists always have a dream project. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what did you say? Take exhibition at the Tate, just put it I, too, would like that exhibition <laughs> at the Tate. So uh, someone's listening. <laughs> <laughs> you have our emails. <laughs> <laughs> um, what have I got coming up? Um, I guess I'm trying to wind down at the end of the year. What's coming up? I guess I have open studios at my studio um, coming okay. up. Um, uh, I think the 9th and 10th of December. Um, I'll be selling little Christmas baubles. <laughs> oh, that sounds great. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm ready for that. Um, I can't think of what my dream project would be right now because I think I have like an ever-changing answer. If you'd mm -hmm. asked me a few months ago, I would have said, I want to open a jazz club. Um, That's a great dream project. That's a whole other story. That. I would like to go. Um, <laughs> but right now, I don't know. And I don't think that far ahead because I'm just like, I'm just trying to get through the month. So mm -hmm. if you ask me next year, I have a much better answer. You'll have a whole four-year plan. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have, I have two months. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, it's been so great to talk to you. Um, and I hope you have the rest, good rest of your uh, late tonight. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. the ticket.
General, General Jekyll.
Okay. How close do you hold it to your mouth? A little bit closer? Okay. Is it like that? I don't know. Probably oh, not. Mine's closer. <laughs> uh, one, two, one, two. Yeah, and one, two, one, Great. two. Um, Mic check. Yeah. yeah? No, that's what I thought. I forget what questions I wrote. Yeah, I got them here. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they're, they're far,
Um, hello everyone, hi, um, thank you so much for joining us and during a, a, an important football game as well, uh, so thank you for being here. Um, my name is Michael Raymond, I'm an assistant curator here at Tate Modern and the co-curator of the Cezanne exhibition. Um, so yeah, again, thanks all for, for joining us on this talk about, um, I suppose, Cezanne and, and the importance of uh, locality and, and your local area in art making. Um, we were meant to be joined by Emma Farrens, who uh, very unfortunately came down with, um, with I think, a fever uh, in the last couple of days. But I'm delighted that we're joined by, by Ruby Wright. Um, so thank you for coming. Thank on. you. Thanks, <laughs> thanks everyone for coming. Um, so I thought I'd just kickstart uh, by asking you whether you could tell us a little bit about your creative pathway and how you came to be uh, an illustrator and an artist? Um, yeah, so I am um, I was born in Winchester and I grew up in Dorset and studied sculpture at Winchester School of Art. Um, and then basically when I got a 2-1, I felt really furious and stopped being an artist and worked for the BBC and did um, some work for some other organisations, sort of worked in the real world for a, a decade. And then when I had kids, one of whom is here in the front row, and you'll see them up here. Um, uh, Childcare being so expensive, it didn't seem worth going back to a job I didn't love. So I decided to retrain, and I'd always wanted to be an illustrator. I'd always been totally um, in love with picture books, children's books. Um, I feel like the artists who illustrated the books of my childhood are like the biggest influences that I've, I've had, really. But... One of the reasons I did sculpture was that I didn't think I was very good at drawing. And luckily at Wimbledon, they didn't make us do any drawing. So I was really happy about that, and I just made stuff. And I was really frightened of drawing. And um, then when I went into doing this illustration, I suppose I did a lot from photographs, and I was frightened. And then I started having some tutorials with um, a designer, and she said, well, you've just got to go and draw. You just forget about making illustrations, forget about writing stories, you've just got to draw, draw, draw from life every day. Don't use photographs. Don't use black. She banned me from using black pen because I did everything in a black pen. And um, so that's what I started doing about, I don't even know, six or seven years ago, I just started going out and drawing every day. And now it's become part of my practice and I, I have to do it. Um, my friend who's here called me a parasite, a drawing parasite. Because any situation, I, I sort of have to draw. I would be drawing here now if I wasn't up here talking. Um, so, yeah, so I draw from life every day, and then I make picture books. And I've just got my first book coming out next year, which is really exciting. So that's my pathway. 
Yeah, great. Well, just out of interest, what is the book? The book is called Animal Crackers, and it's a picture book, so for three to six-year-olds. And it's born out of lockdown, actually. Um, there's a really, for those of you who don't know and are interested in illustration, there's um, an amazing group of people called um, Good Ship Illustration, and they started doing this art club on a Friday night, and it's free, and you can join in on Instagram. And uh, so that we'd all just get out whatever, you'd draw with whatever you've got and draw whatever you've got in front of you. So I started drawing um, lots of stuff from the cupboards. And then I had this idea. I, I was looking at the, um, the, uh, the tin of um, golden syrup with a little lion on it. There's a picture of it up here. And then I started noticing these animals appearing on different packages. And I thought, oh, well, they could come to life in the cupboard at night. So that's what the story's about. It's about living in a small flat in central London with a child who desperately wants a pet. And they're not allowed a pet, so... It sounds like me. Yeah. <laughs> and me. <laughs> um, so, uh, so to Suzanne, um, <laughs> um, I mean, one of the things that uh, we were really interested in in the exhibition uh, was how Suzanne's really continually drawn to the local, whether that be uh, local landscapes, and uh, he loved Provence, the, the place where he was from, whether that be local people, uh, he loved to paint and, and draw um, uh, the, the farm workers and the laborers that worked on his estate, whether it was local objects, the like apples, of course, um, but also locally produced and manufactured goods. Um, so I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about uh, your local environments and how you draw inspiration from them. Um, and I suppose, like, why is it that you like to depict local scenes? Well, there's a couple of... Oh, they're just gone. Uh, so I live really close to here, and um, I grew up in the countryside, and I, I go there a lot, but I find unlike Cezanne, landscape so beautiful and perfect already, you know, the English landscape that I'm familiar with, I'm not interested in drawing that. So I'm much, much more drawn to the urban and the messy and the gritty and I suppose the familiar, well, of course the familiar, the stuff that's around us. And in terms of people, you know, the easiest people to draw are the people you see every day. And I know Cezanne didn't really use models at all, did he? He drew his family a lot and so I completely relate to that and, and here they all are and you know so much of this stuff was done in lockdown when we couldn't we couldn't go anywhere and see anyone else and, and it was very good practice actually just having to look at the same faces and draw them again and again and again and I think I suppose drawing things and people that you love um, I hope that is trans I hope that's vis visible in the drawings I hope that my connection to them comes across it, it, these are quite deep relationships with these places and these people. Um, so, I mean, I guess it's born of necessity, but there's something deeper that hopefully comes as a result of it. Um, and I think I love this particular part of London where I live because um, it's quite, it's very mixed. I live on an estate that's an amazing mix of, of people and it feels quite real um, and it's not too polished. I'm, I'm not really interested in drawing the shiny buildings um, I like the, the, the kind of the stuff that, that's very accessible and, um, yeah. It, it's funny that because, um, I mean, in many ways, Suzanne actually, uh, I, I mean, hate's a strong word. He did not like to paint <laughs> uh, the urban environments around him. I think there's around maybe uh, five or six paintings that Suzanne ever makes of of urban his urban surroundings and two of those are actually copies of his friends paintings of urban landscapes so there's really only like two or three um and he did he was really drawn to uh yeah to the to the more kind of like rural idylls if you like um though not necessarily always the most impressive or the most picturesque he was often he was often taken with i think quite surprising uh, viewpoints or not necessarily the most picturesque or impressive um. I find it really interesting that he didn't draw Paris. You know, he, I, th I think you, you mentioned that he travelled back and forth from Aix to Paris a lot. So, like, did he do that on the train? And why didn't he draw on the train? <laughs> and Paris must have been incredible then, so why didn't he? But he, he wasn't interested in it, like I'm not interested in drawing the countryside. But I find that really c extraordinary and fascinating. Yeah, Yeah. I, I mean, I think it was something to do with um, probably the the control that he couldn't have over a street. Um, even in places like, uh, there's a small fishing village uh, called Les Stack where he likes to go to paint. 
and he never goes to paint. Um, there's, a, there's a busy boulevard by the port there. He never goes to paint that. He's always painting up on the hill, always looking for the quieter places. And I think it's almost, um, uh, he couldn't handle people moving or, or, or busy streets because he couldn't depict them fast enough. But that's obviously very different to your practice. I wonder if also, like if you sit and draw in, for example, Brixton Market, people come up and talk to you and ask you about what you're doing and it's very public and if you're doing a crap drawing then that's embarrassing. Maybe you didn't like that. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, I, I feel like too, for me, I, I'm not an artist at all, um, but I feel like I'd find it very difficult to, to, to draw and illustrate scenes where people are moving and busy around, uh, you know, and I don't know how, how you find that um, as an illustrator. Yeah, it's definitely a challenge. Um, I mean, in this image here with the three people getting their breakfast, and so this is some work I've done with an organisation called Refugee Tales, and um, I was their artist in residence for a bit. And I guess with something like that, I'd, you know, you get a bit of the um, you get a bit of the hard lines, the things that are not, not going to move in first, and then you pop the people in. But you can see that I've had to draw one person over someone else's arm because they've arrived, and I liked that person. I wanted to put them in. I think I feel that. I mean, drawing is different from painting, I think, and I'm not a painter. Um, and I feel like drawing is never going to be perfect. Sketching it, 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 um, from life is never going to be perfect. And I think that's quite exciting. And I'm sort of beginning to accept that, that those drawings, they're all going to have some wonkiness to them. But there's um, an honesty about that, and I like it. So, yeah. Yeah. Again, funny, because Suzanne's sketches, they're either always of statues or people asleep. <laughs> so, yeah, I feel, feel like he could only really handle someone being <laughs> completely, truly still. Well, I think that's, he's sensible, isn't he, to do that? And I, I, my son, who, who I draw a lot, he reads a lot, so he, that's a really nice position because he's sitting there and he's looking down. And I mean, actually, he does move all the time. He's constantly moving his limbs, but essentially his face is sort of pointing in one direction and that's helpful. And the other thing is, I noticed that Suzanne, like you said, he draws a lot from statues and other paintings. And I think my equivalent of that is now drawing from films. Um, so I don't draw from photographs, but I love the way that um, uh, directors frame stuff. You know, they're, they're masters at it. So if you want to think of an interesting composition for something, looking at a film is amazing. So, and you can pause that and that does stay still. But uh, yeah, that's more sort of preliminary stuff. Um, well, back to, the, back to the local. Um, Suzanne was an avid explorer of his locality. He would often walk for, for miles and miles and miles um, between different places in his locality, constantly exploring, looking for new vistas and vantage points. And I wondered, does your, does your practice help you to explore your local area? And conversely, uh, does your local area make you want to go out and, and draw, I suppose? Yeah, I think, I think drawing your local area does change your relationship with it. Um, and I probably find myself a lot hanging out in playgrounds and things where I happen to have to be anyway. Um, and actually, I find going to new places really inspiring. Like if some, somehow you, can s you look more carefully if you're going to a new place, whereas the old familiar, maybe, maybe I don't look well enough at it even though it does appeal to me. I guess these are some of my neighbours. We, we live on the fifth floor, and um, so we have this amazing view. Like, you get this incredible view down. I love that. Um, but, sorry, going back to your question. Um, sorry, I've lost my train of thought. Um, it was about, uh, does, do you explore your local area to draw, and then through drawing your local area, does that help you to, do you feel like that helps to, you to get to know your local area and look at it through new... New uh, lenses. I definitely, I definitely feel like I s spend longer in places that I wouldn't were I not drawing them. And often, like, I'll go to a, a place because there's a bench. It's something really simple. If there's somewhere you can pause and stop, then you'll spend more, more time there. But the other thing is, I mentioned Refugee Tales, this organisation I've been working with, and they do this annual walk. It's a sort of almost like a pilgrimage, and you walk quite a long way every day, like maybe 20 miles, something like that, and then everyone stays in often church halls or whatever on the floor. So um, when they asked me to, to be artist in residence, I thought, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw while I walk. And 
I, I <laughs> made this um, t sort of tool belt thing so I can put all my pencils around my waist. But I got sort of travel sick trying to walk and draw at the same time. That was my, that's why I can't do it. So, yeah, uh, so I do, I do walk and draw, but I have to stop. Um, yeah. And, and, and I suppose, like, does it, I guess it really makes you, um, whenever you're drawing, it really makes you pay attention and, and look and, and notice things. Have you noticed anything about this local area in particular that you wouldn't have otherwise, or I don't know? Good question. Might have to think about that. Might have to think about it. I definitely draw a lot of um, railway stations, and, you know, obviously there's a lot of railway arches. I love the sort of, um, I love kind of Victorian <laughs> railway architecture. I love rivets. There's, there's a lot, lot of, of rivets. around here, so yeah. it's good. <laughs> rivets, ru rubbish. Yeah, rivets and rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just uh, something you said made me think back to um, Suzanne's depictions of Mont Saint-Victoire as well, because you were saying, um, I think you were saying that um, once you get to really know a place, you're not so interested in drawing it. Is that right? Yeah, I think... <laughs> There's nothing like, like we went to Newcastle a couple of weeks ago and just sitting on a different tube line was so exciting, even though it is, well, it's not any more exciting really than the London Underground. But yeah, I think, I don't know what it is, but yeah, I feel like you're really alert when you're in a new place. Yeah, um, I feel like we're just drawing out a lot of like opposites <laughs> <laughs> between <laughs> Susanna <laughs> but I was because I, I was going to say I mean like one of the things that I think comes across uh, really strongly and probably in the exhibition if anyone's been around it yet um, is I mean famously Suzanne goes to depict Mont Saint Victoire this mountain on the outskirts of of X and he 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 paints it from I think some of the first paintings are of like 1870 where it's just a feature in the background but really in the last years of his life and he, at this point he's made more than 80 paintings of the mountains you still you still get a sense that he's looking at it afresh and anew um with with yeah with new open eyes and noticing new things and and the changing of the light and um i, I don't know that just struck me as yeah i think that's that's his real skill isn't yeah, it yeah looking for a long time uh, yeah yeah he really loved that mountain yeah, yeah. I need to find my Mont Saint Victoire. But maybe also he was a little bit, I like to think he was a bit older, but he wasn't very old, was he, when he died? But maybe it's you 60s. get into a more, yeah, I'm not quite there yet. Yeah. Maybe you get into a more peaceful place. I think I'm quite frenetic. Like, yeah, what's next? What's new? What's, yeah. what's yeah, what's new to see? Are there, other than the, the tube, any good new places you found to draw? <sighs> oh, good new places to draw. Um, wow, gosh, good question. Um, Look at all these railways. I mean, they're all great. I've been, I, li I like sitting on a train and then it stops and you have, you know, 30 seconds. Now, how long does a train stop in a station for? Two minutes. And then you've got that lovely frame of the window to draw what's outside. And it's like, you know, it's constantly changing because it's a train. <laughs> I might try taking that up. We're, yeah. We're, yeah. I, f I feel like that's a good challenge, trying yeah. to draw your train. Also, yeah, you've got this constraint, real time yeah. constraint and, and frame constraint. It's a really good, yeah. good that one. That sounds like a good game to play on a train. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I was also going to say, kind of um, in opposition to the locals, Suzanne had this way of elevating what he was drawing or, or painting to give it a kind of a universal feel. Like, um, again, going back to Mont Saint Victoire. Uh, I don't think anyone has to have actually been to Mont Saint Victoire to get this real sense of presence of the mountain from from a painting, or to wh whether it's that or whether it's um, any of the other like localities in and around um, X that that he's painting. You just like the Le Stack Room, for example, um, in the exhibition. You get this. Um, there's a kind of deep, almost like universal connection to the to a painting like that, um, which is almost opposed to to the local, which is something that is less widely well known. Um, I'm rambling a bit, <laughs> but I wondered whether that's something you ever think about in your practice about, you know, how you have these deeply personal or local scenes, but how they're somehow able to reach out um, beyond meaning something more t to just you, uh, to have a more, like a much wider resonance. Yeah. I. I think that is really important. And I don't know whether I consciously think about that when I'm trying to draw something. 
I think I feel like is it I'm quite interested in things that sort of make me laugh so if I think it's quite a funny thing or if I can put something in or ju juxtapose, juxtapose two objects to say something that amuses me I, I think that's hopefully going to amuse other people too and I think that you know well, we, we do live in a very globalised world now so the product that I'm drawn to probably not manufactured here or they may be or they may be available all around the world so you know some stuff is going to be recognisable but I think also you know I think if, if you deeply care about what you're drawing about even if it's just for a moment <laughs> hopefully someone else is going to deeply care about it too so I think it's it's in the in the pen it's in the pencil it's in the hand of the person drawing it hopefully that makes it universal but it doesn't always work of course people sometimes don't it's really interesting like with social media you can tell what people respond to now and you can be really surprised that something tickles somebody's fancy which you didn't think much of or you or, or, or the opposite i i think i'd said this to you the other day when, when we met but i'm going to share it with the rest of the room too because i was at um as a poetry jazz night the other night so slight eye roll but um <laughs> Uh, no, it was great. I was seeing um, the poet Anthony Joseph, and he said, um, the personal is the universal. And um, well, but by which I think he was meaning, you know, sh actually share it, sharing more of your personal experience has that more of a you know, universal resonance. I think that's very true of a lot of your illustrations. And in Thank your practice. you. I mean, we're all trying to be our true selves or whatever now, aren't we, all over the social media. So, um, yeah, I think people do obviously respond to what's what's personal. These drawings that I did of my neighbours are, um, you know, we, we've got, we have got, we're a very close-knit community, but I did these surreptitiously, so I feel they're quite voyeuristic. I don't know if that, I don't know if they feel that way. Whereas the family stuff, obviously, I'm not hiding it, but they, I think there is a different relationship that you have with a, with a subject that knows you're drawing with them than one who doesn't. I don't feel entirely comfortable drawing people who well, don't, don't know, know it no and I also I don't look at them properly because I'm scared they're going to notice I'm drawing them and so they, they lose something although you can get the shapes of people and anyway but yeah it's a more hit and miss yeah yeah and as that is something uh that I think Suzanne really shared is <coughs> Suzanne um was very much I think reliant on his family his his son and uh his his partner and wife um Hortense VK um as, as models, which really helped him with his portraiture practice. And I don't think he felt as comfortable around professional models and those that he didn't know, which is why he went back so, so many times to paint um, his son and, and his wife. Um, I think you can see that. I think you can see that in the, in the pictures that are in the show. And also I think he clearly was so comfortable around, I mean, I don't, particularly his son, the way he let him draw in his sketchbook, if you haven't been to see the show you must look at the sketchbook with his son's drawings and just amazing I mean this child drew on Suzanne's sketchbook <laughs> it's just it's lovely it's it's a real um you feel it's a two-way relationship yeah yeah um I yeah I wondered is there is there anything else that goes into your your choice of, of subjects and um uh, you know is there anything else that goes into like how you choose what you what you want to depict oh good question I think I'm quite lazy. I think I just, oh, just grab what's in front of me. But uh, there's, there's sometimes something appears in front of you, like there's an image out of a train window of these two men um, on Salisbury platform that I saw the other day, and you just think, oh, I've got to get it. It's like I, you just got it. I've got to catch it. Um, that excitement. Um, oh, it's people interacting, I suppose. It's people interacting with each other and and the environment. But I think I'm not very good at planning stuff. Like, like I say, I'll, I'll see something and I've got to draw it. Or I'll start drawing. I always start drawing people's hands. So I think what people are doing with their hands is the thing that maybe that draws me in. And then I'm like, oh, God, what am I going to do with the rest of this thing? Yeah, I'm not very good at planning. So you often start with the hands. Always, and then pretty much out. always, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. 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 Um, I always think Suzanne's hands are very odd. I love that. Super, that, super weird. There's <laughs> that brilliant um, painting of the, what, it's the bather, the man. Oh, God, it's so beautiful. But his hands look really sausagey. But I love them. They're so funny. Yeah. They're brilliant. Yeah. And his the feet are quite good, actually. Yeah. I mean, they're all quite good. There's, uh, there's one of Madame Suzanne as well. Um, and I always think her fingers are almost uh, roots-like. You know, they almost look like bits of tree and, and limbs and roots. They're very, they're really strange. 
<laughs> um, was there anything else when you were going around the exhibition that, that you felt that you really you know, could relate to in Suzanne's work? Or I, lo I mean, I loved his you? patterns. I loved his you know, use of pattern fabric. And I think, um, I think that I'm drawn to patterns and fabric as well. It's sort of, you can convey a lot of character through the stuff you've got around you. Um, and, I and all this, the family stuff. And I, but his color palette is amazing, really amazing. I mean, I'm, I'm not really a green person. I don't really use green at all. And um, actually, I love his paintings that aren't so green. Um, there's some really exquisite whites and blues and purples. And God, he's good at that. Yeah, yeah. yeah he was all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have no idea how we're doing for timing. But um, I, I think at this point, I want to open it up to questions. I don't know if anyone has any. Oh, great, a few. There's a microphone coming round. Uh, oh, we'll take, we'll take this one first, I think. And then, and then over. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you. I wondered if you would introduce the lady who's signing and to find out a little bit about whether she works directly with the museum or the galleries and how you came to work together. <laughs> Re <laughs> Rebecca. Yeah, it's really not Oh, but thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I, th I think all the talks tonight, uh, 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 we have a BSL signer um, as, a, as a kind of policy for Tate. So, yeah, yeah, no, thank you. Um, was there, did you have a question? Um, have you tried any new different type of medias yet? And I've not even shown to the public. That's a nice question. Um, well, I tend to draw with coloured pencil and I use these children's paint sticks um, a bit and a bit of ink sometimes. So this, that's, that's, only, that's only a very small um, number of media. And when I make my picture books, I tend to screen print everything and then I work digitally. But I'm a bit frightened of paint. It seems a bit grown up and proper for me. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, no, I, I, I feel like I should keep on experimenting with materials. Things like charcoal and pastels, I, I've never quite got my head around, but I'd like to think that maybe I could develop that. Uh, I think there's one, there was one at the back and then one at the front. Um, I was just going to say, when I, when I draw, I sometimes get a bit lost in it and then end up spending ages trying to make something look perfect and spend too much time on it. And I was just wondering, how do you know when you've finished a sketch? How do you know when to move on and just call it, you say you've finished with that one? <laughs> My mum always used to say that I would always say, that, that'll do about everything as a kid. So I think I'm probably quite lazy or like to finish things <laughs> fast. Um, I think it helps if you're really uncomfortable. So if you need a wee, or if you're sitting on a cold stone thing, or you're squatting on one of your legs, or your child says, it's time to go. Um, so yeah, having limits, and all like on the train, you know, you're gonna leave the station. So I do do, do everything very fast. And, um, oh good, yeah, I, I think it just comes with practice. I think you just gotta keep doing lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and, lots and then you kind of know when you've, yeah reach that point but I think I think it's also yeah I, I I don't tend to overwork stuff just because I think I my attention spans too short so yeah maybe set yourself very like and warm-up sketches are really good so I always call my first drawing my pancake sketch because it's going to be awful and you've got to throw it away but um yeah you know spend 30 seconds see see how much you can capture in 30 seconds and the other thing that I found really useful is when you're looking at something, think, what's the thing I care about most? And make sure it's right there and you're going to have room to fit the whole thing on the paper and get it in there quick. And then everything else can sort of blur <laughs> into the background. I was going to add, I, I feel like it's something that I often hear artists really struggle with. How do you know when a painting or how do you know when a work or drawing or anything is actually finished? Um, 
it's something that I think you see that Suzanne really struggled with too. There are certain paintings which are so heavily overworked and he worked on the, the large bathers, these three largest paintings he ever made for more than 10 years. Um, <laughs> he, had, he started them around 1895 and was still working on them at the time that he died. Um, whereas there are loads of works in the exhibition which, you know, for the time are considered unfinished and there are bits of bare empty canvas. Um, yeah, you know, I think we still today consider them very much finished. So They're beautiful. Uh, I love seeing those yeah. edges. They're great, aren't they? Yeah. Actually, scale is really important too. If you, if, you, yeah, if you work really, really small to start with or do thumbnails, then you don't have time or you don't have space or, I don't know, scale, play with scale. Um, it was a, do you have a question? At the, yeah, one at the front and then one over there. Thank you. Yeah, hi. I mean, I can hear you. My daughter is an illustrator, so I can hear a lot of things you said. I can, it resonates. And um, so um, what I want to say is my daughter, she did um, a course in the Royal Drawing School. So she was associated with a lot of fine artists. So that kind of confused her quite a lot because she says exactly the same. She's not really a fine artist and I know the colors. It's also a big problem for her. And so I believe she's a bit younger than you. So um, what would you say to her that she doesn't, because she is not fitting the niche as an illustrator. At the same time, she doesn't fit the niche as a fine artist. She's something in between. What advice would you give her to not feel too confused about? I think she's just got to do what she loves. She's just got to focus on the stuff and the subjects that she loves, and it will become obvious, mm. I think. But you need time. It takes time. She, she was also drawing fish in the Brixton market. She was doing oh, yeah. that as well. <laughs> yeah, it's a good spot. Also, it's got a roof, so you can sit in the rain and yeah, yeah, get, yeah, yeah, get yeah. cold bottom, but you know, yeah, not yeah. so cold. Yeah. Thank you. I think one just over there. Thanks. Uh, I'm quite curious about your picture book because um, most of your drawings are from life and uh, at sporadic moments and so I was wondering how was your process of uh, forming a narrative and uh, drawing according to them and not from life and f mainly from imagination? Yeah, it, it's quite interesting trying to work in two different ways um, simultaneously. I think that if you draw a lot from life, it's going to inform any creative stuff that you do. So I, I hope that as a result of doing all this, um, like the people in my book are sort of more physically feel plausible, I suppose. Um, but yeah, I had to... Well, so the, the book, which is about these animals coming to life from these food packets, I said to the editor of the book, can I use the real, um, you know, the real products? And she said, no, go and invent your invent a whole cupboard full of products you know of your own design so then I had to sort of put on a designer hat and but that was really a joy to do as well um, and yeah and the story are well I mean yeah that, that's a whole other thing <laughs> I, did, I did a course um, on writing for children so that really helped with that but essentially I, I went with this germ of an idea and and and, and the editor amazing woman helped me um, put, you know give it a shape but yeah, it is quite weird doing these two different. Yeah, because the picture book work is not is not really well, it's not the same materials for starters. But I I hope, you know, I do worry about whether I seem like two different people in my work. And I didn't include any picture book work here deliberately because I thought, oh, it might be too confusing. But oh, I don't know. I don't know. It, I'm just going to have to marry them closer together. I think. So what material is the picture books? So they um, I basically I draw everything in pencil and then I turn it into a screen print, and then uh, it's a complicated thing, but basically I do something, these colour separations, so everything that is pink that's going to be published is drawn in black, and it is one layer, and then everything that's yellow is another layer, and I layer them all up. So it's like a digital screen print. I think, I think there's one hand up at the back. Uh, thank you very much. I just wanted to ask about the, um, the voyeuristic aspect of your work. I just want to ask kind of which aspects of your work do you think would change or you would lose 
if your, su if your subjects of your work knew they were being depicted? That's a nice question. Um, maybe it wouldn't change. Maybe it's just my own embarrassment that I don't want them to n know. Uh, I mean, I do draw people, you know, I don't, I don't sort of hide my stuff under the table um, so people can see, but, oh, yeah, how would it change? I don't like the voyeurs. I don't like being voyeuristic. It's not, it's not something that I think adds to the work. I don't know the answer. It's a good question, though. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, any any final questions? No. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming, everyone. Um, really hope you enjoy the rest of the Tate Late uh, at Suzanne. And um, yeah, thanks for being such a great audience. Thank you. Thank you. Ruby. Thank you. Thank you.
sorry, it was the second half of the third. Oh, right, okay. Um, but you've got six times, that's so many easy. It is. I
sometimes it's a bit weird if I leave halfway through the queue. I might say something at the beginning, like, yep, I'm going to hand over because Sammy. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to do this and get building. <laughs> yeah, so I'll take two minutes at 25. Yeah. I can't actually read anymore on my own. I love this. <laughs> <laughs> I think tutorials would take later. Brilliant, love it. Thank you. Great. All right, well, we'll just keep it up in a couple of minutes. Yeah, it's a good thing. Oh, that's all right. Yeah. Right, hello everybody. Hi, thanks so much for joining us here this evening. Um, I'm Catherine Wood. I'm director of program here at Tate Modern. Welcome to Tate. I hope you're having a very nice evening. Uh, this is Lottie Johnson, who is the curator of the Carole Schneeman exhibition that's on at the Barbican at the moment. A fantastic, sprawling exhibition of the um, late, great, avant-garde downtown artist, famous since the 70s in New York for her body art and performance, body politics. And Lottie, I wondered if you could start by just telling us a little bit about yourself and about the Schneeman show that's on. We've got a few images here. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Catherine. Um, yeah, and thank you all for coming tonight. So I'm Lottie. Um, I'm a curator at the Barbican, and I'm particularly interested in feminist and performative practices, hence why I came to Carolee Schneeman's work. Um, and first encountered her work as a history of art student. She definitely was not on my curriculum, but was kind of looking for contemporary artists who were gonna challenge what I was studying um, and the kind of history of art that I was, I was looking at at that time, which was 20th century modernism. So it's kind of nice actually that Schneeman and Suzanne are coming back together today. Um, but the exhibition at the Barbican has been about three years in the making um, and it was quite bittersweet. We were about to approach Carolee Schneeman herself um, to propose the exhibition when she passed away in the spring of 2019. Um, and that's kind of where my journey began working on the exhibition. So I never knew her and got to know her, her work, her life, through her friends, through her archive, um, through the work itself. Um, and the exhibition really celebrates Schneeman as an artist working from and of the body and thinking about why her work is still resonant um, and relevant today and how we might continue to be challenged by it, to be empowered by it, to interrogate the world around us um, thanks to her provocations and prompts. Um, she was this incredibly interdisciplinary artist working with everything from painting to her own body to assemblage, kind of the detritus of everyday life that she brought in from her studio into her work. Um, incredibly experimental filmmaker. She made all these amazing multimedia installations, these really immersive spaces 
that envelop us and she was very interested in kind of new technologies, how we engage with images on the internet, through, the, through media, through the television. Um, so she, yeah, she was this incredibly kind of porous artist materially but also conceptually um, and subject matter wise. I think everyone often knows Schneemann as a feminist, this kind of radical body performance artist, but actually um, she didn't just make work about women's bodies and about her own experience as a woman and the misogyny that she faced. She also made work about kind of more broadly sensory bodily experience um, and also made a lot of really political work about human suffering um, and the kind of ethics of military aggression and how we must kind of bear witness to the atrocities in the world around us. So, yeah, this incredible kind of um, expansive practice that, that really drew me to her and, yeah, we hope resonates with, with people still today. Mm. Yeah, the show is a major achievement, I think, in bringing all of that body of work together. Oh, thank you. I mean, yeah, quite staggering and fantastic piece of research that you've done. I knew her first through her engagement with a, a group of downtown dancers in New York in the 1960s, the Judson Dance Theatre, when she made her famous piece, Meet Joy, a kind of extension of the painting into bodily space, naked uh, painted bodies writhing around with chicken carcasses, a sort of post-actionist, ordinary dance, de-skilled dance piece, quite amazing. Mm. She also, um, when she was alive, did an incredible film screening here at Tate over 10 years ago when it was all about her relationship with her cat, which was another famous part of Carolee, wasn't it? Slides of her and... Her cat, I can't remember her cat's Absolutely, name. Absolutely, yeah. Well, she, she had many cats well, throughout her lifetime. Yes. And actually, she refused to call them her cat. She always um, rejected the possessive pronoun in relation to cats. So they were cats who lived with her. They were protagonists, muses, collaborators in her work. Actually, Cecilia Vicuña, whose work is on in the Turbine Hall, her assistant had inherited Carolee's cat, or the cat that owned Carolee. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a nice artistic kind of matrilineal, catrilineal lineage. Um, but we're here tonight because of Carolee's book, Cezanne, She Was a Great Painter. Mm. Um, and it was part of her thinking about herself as a painter, and in a way, the status of being a painter, I guess, versus being a performance artist. There was a little bit of a gendered thing going on in the 60s in New York where the art, you know, the, the artists, the male artists were painters and sculptors, and the women were body artists or performers or dancers. I mean, it wasn't a strict thing, but there was some bias going on there. She um, said that around 12 years old, I knew a few names of great artists, and I decided that a painter named Cezanne would be my mascot. I'd assume Cezanne was unquestionably a woman. Um, and it, interestingly, my 12-year-old daughter, when I mentioned the Cezanne show here, and I've obviously failed, uh, to teach my children about art, thought that she, I said Suzanne. So, <laughs> you know, Carolee chose and feminized the name in order to make a precedent for herself as an artist because she wasn't seeing women artists that she could look up to. I was just wondering if you could say something a bit more about that publication and that kind of need to project yourself into a, a role model like that that she took up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, the title of the book is brilliant. Suzanne, she was a great painter because, you know, this, this book was, was made in the 70s, by which time Schneeman knew that Suzanne was not a man. Um, I was not a woman, sorry. Um, was, in fact, a man. Um, and so she kind of, as you said, persisted with this kind of feminizing of his practice. Um, but when she did discover that he was a man, she didn't set his work aside, and actually his, his work was, remained a really strong and powerful point of reference and influence for her throughout her life. Um, like many other artists, she was really struck by Cezanne's use of the kind of broken line and this kind of shifting sensory perception of the world, making us look at everyday life and the familiar with kind of new eyes. And I think that really extends into to Schneemann's own work. She was often kind of taking, she often said, my work is where I live. She was literally taking the source material of her life into her work. Um, but I think, yeah, the book itself, she opens it with this great story about how she thought Suzanne was a woman because of the name Anne in his name. Um, and 
but then the, the book itself is a collection. It's a kind of self-archive of Schneemann's own work. So it starts with this kind of provocation of Cezanne, and then it opens up into to Schneemann gathering her own writing, these kind of erotic pieces of writing, letters to friends, performance scripts. She kind of, she knew that no one else was going to archive her life and work, so she had to do that work herself, which I think is amazing and kind of speaks to this kind of tension um, that she existed within in the 60s and 70s in New York, where she was constantly encountering her contemporaries, male artists who were finding success in a very different way to her, who had commercial gallery shows, who were selling their work when she wasn't. Um, and she actually kind of, although she took great inspiration from her contemporaries, Robert Rauschenberg, Klaus mm. Oldenburg, she performed in Oldenburg's The Store days. Um, she was great friends with Robert Rauschenberg and really admired his work, kind of saw it embodying the, what she called the spirit of the now, um, which I kind of love that, her description of Rauschenberg. But however, she did kind of um, coin this new term for, the, for her male contemporaries, the art stud club. Um, and she spent most of her life kind of pushing back against this idea of this stud club who, um, yeah, she had to kind of work with and against. Um, and she also was constantly looking for what she called her missing precedents. And these were these kind of creative, powerful women who had come before her and perhaps been deliberately discarded, oppressed, written out of history. Um, and she was always trying to kind of bring them back into her work. She was an avid researcher, kind of looked into the history of goddess um, symbols and iconography throughout time and across cultures. Um, and often in her early paintings and these kind of assemblages that she made embedded photographs of these forgotten women, everyone from quite obscure figures like Wanda Landowska, who's this amazing early female harpsichordist, to um, Lou Andrea Salome, who was an amazing psychoanalyst. So these women whose voices had been kind of silenced and hadn't been recognized alongside um, their peers who, who were men. Yeah, I love that, the search for the goddess precedent. Yeah. She did say, when we were working on a Rauschenberg show here, I t spoke to her about their friendship, and she mm. did say that he, whilst there was this kind of frustration for her and other women artists who weren't making the same money in the market, he was one of the figures who was incredibly generous, hosted the best parties, paid her dental and medical bills, and she said, I always went back from his parties with my pockets stuffed with roast beef and fruitcake. Because <laughs> he, you know, he was kind of, there was an art ecology where the ones who made money were supporting the ones that didn't. But nevertheless, um, particularly the gender, you know, dynamics of that were really difficult. Mm. Um, I wondered, in terms of the painting and the painterliness of her work, which is not only on canvas, but through the body of work and how she literally works on the body as a surface, which was you know, such a feminist take on painting in that period, actually. The idea of makeup, um, masquerade, body painting as an alternative to using the rectangle of, of the canvas. Mm. But formally, um, I wondered if you could say something about her painting in relation to your experience of this Cezanne exhibition here, actually, and what it was like to think about her work that you've just been so immersed in as you went round the show. Yeah. Well, I mean, I have to say, when I first read Cezanne, she was a great painter, and I found out that, that Schneemann was so influenced by Cezanne. I, I was kind of curious and slightly bemused by it, so I had to read a lot of her writing about, about his work, and she... She really felt stimulated by the fact that he was kind of experiencing painting as space and time. And that's how she really saw painting herself as this kind of extension of time and space um, and painting really exciting the eye, which was an extension of the body itself. So the way that Cezanne used his brushstrokes to kind of create this really shifting kind of sensory perception of the world, um, she felt like that kind of stimulated and activated the body itself. Um, Annie Schneeman herself would often put on music in the studio and dance kind of as she warmed up before painting, <laughs> uh, which I also love that kind of idea that movement was kind of central to her painting practice, even from the very beginning. Um, but yeah, I, um, when I was walking around the exhibition, sort of made some quite, um, so this is an excerpt from Suzanne. She was a great painter, the book. Do you want to read a bit of that? Or, I know you did a bit of a reading earlier. But. Yeah. Um, Yes, it's, it's a, I mean, it's a, great, it's a great story. I'll just jump to the end where she said, I decided a painter named Cezanne would be my mascot. 
I would assume Suzanne was unquestionably a woman. After all, the Anne in it was feminine. Were the bathers I studied in reproduction so awkward because painted by a woman? But she was famous and respected. If Suzanne could do it, I could do it. <laughs> so, you know, she's really kind of positioning Suzanne as her heroine here. Um, which I love then, the fictional project, projection, the permission she takes to conjure the world that, isn't, that she wanted to be there that wasn't. That's absolutely. Great. And actually later in that text, um, you know, she describes the predicament of being a woman artist and she says, you know, how throughout your life you'll be told, you can do it and then don't you dare. Mm. Uh, so this kind of conflicting message. Um, but yeah, I kind of started, as I was walking through the Cezanne exhibition, making these quite basic formal comparisons between... Suzanne and Schneeman's work, but it kind of ended up being quite generative. Like even mm. just these two early um, self-portraits, you know, this idea of the self-portrait is the projection of the artist, projecting their own image into the world. And I think you see these two figures kind of very tenaciously staring back at you. Um, Schneeman actually hated this self-portrait. Um, you know, this is one of her most figurative works. Her later works are much more kind of hovering between figuration and abstraction. Um, but you do see these two artists who are kind of setting out to, to challenge the boundaries of representation, to challenge the boundaries of art um, in very different centuries and kind of time periods. It's, um, just, it's interesting with the portraits, isn't it? Because they still, they're just about opticality, looking in the mirror and painting yourself. And what she wanted to do to bring her whole self, literally, in an embodied way into the picture. Absolutely, yeah. And Schneeman, for, her, for Schneeman, her body was a medium. It was a kind of integral medium, as she called it. Mm. Um, and she really, she saw it as a tool, as, as a way of, of, of expressing herself in the same way as picking up a paintbrush, making a film. Her body was part of that creative expression. Um, and the kind of act of inserting herself into the work was, of course, a deeply politicised act, a very kind of personal political act in terms of engaging her, her own body as a woman and inserting it into this history. Um, <laughs> under yeah, the spotlight. It's, it, it's interesting to think of a context of artists in that period, like the artist Hannah Wilkie, a peer who did the piece where she was a living sculpture, i.e. measuring the weight and size of her body over days and photographing herself mm. as a kind of record of the changing shape. Or Ellen Arantin's representational painting, where she's putting on makeup and it's a form of transforming her face into a picture of an ideal. There's a lot of that, wasn't there? That was absolutely like questioning around the body image in a in a kind of consumer way too. Definitely. And there's this lovely. Um, I always kind of go back to this quote, this kind of exchange. Schneeman was a great letter writer, and she corresponded with her friends throughout her life and published the letters, made them very public. Um, and one of her friends, Clayton Asherman, wrote to her in the 70s, asking her why she always showed her naked body in her work. And she wrote back kind of furious, saying, you know, I do not show my naked body, I am being my body. And I think that's hmm. this kind of really kind of feminist provo provocation that she's not putting her body on display for objectification, for fetishization. She's really asking us to allow her to exist, to have kind of bodily mm. autonomy and agency mm. as a performer and as a woman. Yeah, owning it and actually refusing it as just a single picture surface. Absolutely, exactly. I mean, it's interesting in relation to the way she wrote about the men that she slept with and had relationships with as well, kind of owning that. Totally, yeah. There's this amazing work, Sexual yeah. Parameters Survey, where she asked other women, along with herself, to document their erotic experiences. Um, and she asked them to kind of categorise everything from kind of orgasm sound to, to genital charge. And, yeah, I mean, there was this... She was really giving people agency to, to, to claim their own erotic experiences and to, to have ownership over that in the way that kind of men were allowed to talk about their sexual experiences, but women weren't in the same way. Mm. Um, yeah. Which brings me on to one of the works in your collection, um, in your show, sorry, which is an important work from the Tate collection, yeah. Interior Scroll from 1975. Oh, you've got an image here, in which um, during an uh, exhibition, Women Here and Now in New York in 1975, to an audience of mainly women, she uh, proceeded to pull this scroll out of her vagina and read the text from it. Um, also, you know, extracts of which are in the Cezanne book. Yeah, so this, yeah, this performance in 1975, before she did this kind of iconic act of pulling the scroll out of her vagina, 
she, she actually got onto a table, as we see here, and she, took, she assumed the poses of a life drawing model, um, which is quite interesting. Schneemann actually was expelled from art college in the 50s because there were no life models at the, the college that she was studying at, Bard in upstate New York. Um, and she decided to paint her own naked body and the body of her, her boyfriend at the time. And she was expelled as a result of this for what she called moral turpitude um, and then moved to New York City after that. So in some ways, I see this kind of first act as part of Interior Scroll, kind of reclaiming these life drawing poses um, as a kind of connection to that kind of rejection um, in the 50s. And then she read from a text called Woman in the Year 2000, um, which is in the book, Suzanne, She Was a Great Painter. And Women in the Year 2000 is this amazing kind of feminist manifesto where Schneemann hopes by the year 2000, and she was performing this work in 1975, that no woman would have to experience the same discrimination and misogyny that she had. Um, mm. and obviously, we're in 2022 mm. now. Um, and she also projected that, you know, every art student or student of history would be studying all these amazing forgotten women who'd been kind of um, rescued from, from history um, and... Well, Un unfortunately, we're getting there. We, we are. are. We're, we're Abakanovich, <laughs> Bartoshova, exactly. Cecilia Bikina. In London, here. you can see some amazing yeah, radical female show. artists at the we're moment. Um, and after she'd read this text, she then proceeded to um, pull this scroll out of her vagina and read another amazing feminist manifesto, um, which is then kind of reinscribed on this, this collage, which is in Tate's collection here, and where she recalls a male structuralist filmmaker critiquing her work for the painterly mess, the kind of personal clutter, all of these deeply sexist criticisms of her work, which she was very proud of and embraced, and these were kind of aspects of her, of her creative expression um, that shouldn't be seen as gendered. Um, and in another iteration of the performance, she also read this amazing text, Be Prepared, which kind of warns women against the experiences that they will face um, in dialogue with men throughout their lives. Um, so it's this really rallying cry against the kind of persistent devaluing of both women's bodies and intellects. Um, and, you know, this is one of the first works I encountered by Schneemann kind of um, a long time ago. And it really, it challenged me to confront the taboos around my own body and, and my own experiences in the world. And I think it still does today. Mm, the early vagina monologues. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting thinking about Schneemann as a writer, because we're talking about her here as a painter, but mm. sh her confessional tone as we said, is kind of a precursor of Tracy Emin or that idea that you can, and many contemporary female fiction or autofiction writers, the idea that you can kind of own the vulnerability of a confessional, personal mode of writing. Because the men at the time, like Donald Judd or Robert Morris, were writing very macho manifestos about why their sculpture was this way or that way. Or Absolutely. And the book, Suzanne, she was a great painter, includes such a range of writing like, as i said these kind of erotic texts about her own sexual experiences with partners letters that she's written into to journals when she was actually living in london in the 70s kind of protesting against their use of gendered language um and also performance scores there's an amazing performance score in the book um called americana i ching apple pie um, which is a kind of performance script for the, the making of or the kind of recipe for creating an apple pie where she asks the reader or the kind of listener to think about why they might be in the kitchen because they don't have a penis um, and to think about that while they're crushing garlic under their heel, uh, which I think yeah. is this amazing kind of enraged provocation. Um, but yeah, often her writing is kind of without punctuation. It's very fluid. It's very kind of almost dream of consciousness. Um, she was an amazing kind of letter writer and she wrote down her dreams every single day. She had an amazing dream mm. diary. Um, so yeah, very different tenor. But then she also, like many of her, her contemporaries who were men, was writing performance scores and scripts. I think there's often this illusion that Schneemann's work was very improvised and chaotic and dynamic, and it certainly was dynamic, but actually it was meticulously planned. And all of her mm -hmm. performances, you know, behind these performances were these amazing kind of reams of notes and instructions for the performers, their body parts, how they could be activated. Um, and actually, I was yeah, going to read yeah. a little bit of a, a text um, that she wrote called What is a Dancer? Mm. Um, which I think is such a, a lovely example of her writing. Oops, sorry. Um, 
Um, so in What is a Dancer, she declares, I want a dance where a body moves as part of its environment. I want a dance where dancers can fall, can crash into a wall, aim movement beyond their line of spine into space, into materials, into each other, projective, connective. A dance where dancers can fart, can start and stop, are aware of the impulse, the necessity by which they move, and its implicit diminution or contrary flow. A dance where dancers can leave the performance and return or not return. I think it's a, yeah. Brilliant. Lovely, kind Thank of, you. in the spirit of Judson, using kind of yeah. the unexpected uh, ex kind of um, eccentricities of everyday life as the Absolutely. source material for performance. All the things you're not meant to put on stage. Exactly. Good at that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're going to open up for a few questions. I'm going to hand over um, to you. But I just, whilst we do, I wondered if you could maybe say something about why you think Schneemann is reson. You know, why does the work resonate now? Mm. And thank you so much because I'm going to leave the questions. <laughs> Thanks, Catherine. Thank yeah. you. Um, yeah. Why is Schneemann so resonant now? I mean, I think mainly um, her address of women's bodily autonomy and agency is so kind of still so charged and resonant and kind of urgent today. Um, and I think we can take a lot from that. Um, but also kind of more broadly, her exploration of the kind of precarious life of both humans and animals. Um, we haven't really talked about it today, but a lot of her work that she made from the 60s was in protest of conflicts like the Vietnam War, um, the war in Sarajevo, um, Israel's invasion of Lebanon in the 80s, 9-11. She was making work about the kind of conflicts that were unfolding around her in the world and thinking about the kind of implication of herself as an American woman, um, often thinking about conflict where the US military had had a really interventional role. Um, and she felt it was her duty to kind of bear witness to these atrocities. Um, and I think that's kind of painfully, painfully still resonant today as well. Just so everyone knows, yeah, so unfortunately, because Catherine is, needs to leave, I'm going to now try and continue to respond in terms of the conversation. But yeah, I Thanks, just Abby. having done, no, of course, thank you for <laughs> being here as well, by the way, um, and for having, letting me quickly jump on as well. Um, yeah, I mean, having done research beforehand for the talk as well, I mean, I just the enormity of all of her work has just been something that I'm just completely dumbfounded by. And all I know is that I'm without a doubt going to probably going to be spending tomorrow going to the exhibition <laughs> uh, and having a look at the show. Um, and I'm just very excited to be able to look at just how large this body of work is, uh, particularly in relation to the book itself. But um, I think we're going to open up the floor for questions. So uh, if you'd like to put your hand up, there's one over there. Uh, thank you very much. Um, really interested to hear about the kind of the missing um, and goddess precedents you were speaking about. Mm. Um, would you be able to speak about um, maybe like the criteria that inspired her research and maybe one or two examples of, of kind of lost women that really inspired her work? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, it's from the 60s, she really started this research project. Um, I think she was uh, convinced that there was a history of women who had been just as involved as the history of men who she was being taught as an art student. Um, and you know, particularly she was interested in this idea of um, kind of historic artifacts, of things that had been found in archeological digs and they'd always been attributed to the work of men. Um, and she was kind of constantly questioning her tutors and saying, well, surely a woman may have made, made this. Um, but more broadly, this kind of prompted her own research into the kind of history of goddesses. Um, and, you know, a few that she was drawing upon were, you know, the Minoan snake goddess, who you can kind of see parallels between Schneemann's work and the poses of the Minoan snake goddess, who kind of recurs throughout um, a lot of amazing sculpture. Um, and Schneemann actually then started to posit her own work in dialogue with, with these figures. So there's an amazing work from the 90s called Unexpectedly Research, where Schneemann places images of her own performances, um, films, um, a kind of like whole pantheon of her previous work in juxtaposition with creative female goddesses from across different cultures, across time periods. Um, so yeah, I'd really recommend looking at that work and you can kind of see um, all of the references that she's drawing upon. But she was also reading kind of Virginia Woolf, Simone de Beauvoir, so contemporary feminist writers who she was looking to for inspiration alongside these kind of more um, mythical or, or not mythical figures. Do we have any more questions? Popping through? Yeah. I go for it. 
Thank you so much for this amazing talk. And I'm just wondering, because I've been to the exhibition twice, and in the beginning of the exhibition, towards like middle-ish, Schneemann's body was constantly present in all of her works, pretty much. But towards the end, especially the political works where she talks about the wider global conflict, she seems to detach herself from the works and to reposition herself as an artist compared to the other works. What do you say about that? Mm, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I think in the political work, I think she's really grappling with herself as a, as a voyeur as, as, and kind of sharing that experience with us. You know, a lot of the, the work that's made in protest against these, these global conflicts that she's viewing via television, via newspapers, printed media, she's thinking about the experience of being at a distance from the work, which I think is sometimes where, why her body becomes removed. Um, but she's thinking about kind of how we're implicated through the process of looking. Um, at human suffering and kind of questioning the ethics of that. Um, interestingly, in the 90s, uh, in the mid 90s, Schneeman was diagnosed with breast cancer and non-Hodgkin lymphoma, and that I think is when her own body came back into her work, um, when she was really grappling with negotiating the experience of her body changing, um, and she kind of described her fight, her battle with these illnesses, um, and she made an amazing work called. Um, known unknown play column in the 90s about this experience of of her changing body um, and also about the history of women being cast as kind of malignant and associated with ideas of evil or disease throughout history and her kind of contending with that alongside her own illness so yeah she kind of oscillates between removing her body and then inserting it back into her work um did you have a question as well <laughs> yeah yeah go for it I, no, no, please. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, I love the exhibition for it. It's absolutely incredible to have you here. And, uh, and congratulations because it's an amazing show. Really. Oh, thank you. That's a great question. Um, yeah, as you say, Schneeman was definitely criticised by her fem many feminist peers, not all, um, but many, for being narcissistic, using her own image. Um, and I think it's really interesting. Um, Eileen Miles, the amazing poet, has written a text for our exhibition catalogue, and they write about how Schneeman was really using her, her, the power of her beauty. She was very aware that she was a beautiful woman and she used that as a kind of her armature, this t tool for subversion almost. And I really do agree with that. You know, she wasn't um, unaware of, of the powers that, that she had been given, you know, not through her own choice. Um, and I think it's, you know, Schneeman's work also kind of came um, to the surface during the sex wars, this kind of hot debate about pornography and censorship, censorship. Um, and I think people found, she made this amazing film called Fuses in the 60s with her partner James Tenney, which was filmed over the course of three years and documented this kind of very consensual, sexual, sensual relationship. So it was a kind of um, homage to their erotic experience as a couple. Um, and she was hotly kind of criticized for that film as well by, by feminists, by lesbian separatists, by men who were enraged by the fact that a woman's sexual experience was being... Um, described on film and um, so I think in some ways those debates are still raging today and I, you know I can't answer necessarily why um, they're still they're still raging from the 60s to the present um, but I think Schneeman's work prompts us to ask those questions you know her works are provocations um, she was very aware of, of the powers that she held um, but I think she was I do feel she was using them in a kind of subversive way Thank you so much. Um, just, I know that we're running over time now, but I just thought there were just two last little questions, very quick questions, which was just that, what, how long is the uh, exhibition at the Barbican Island until? 
It's on till the 8th of January. Fantastic. We've got many weeks to see it still. Oh, yeah. There yeah. we go. So hopefully get there before Christmas. Yeah. Uh, and the last question as well was that because we are discussing the book, um, is there a way to be able to read the book or find it online at all in particular? Or is it completely out of print and really hard to source? <laughs> it is actually in a few libraries. Um, it's in the Tate's library collection. So you can book an appointment in the Tate archive and, and view the book. Um, and we've got one of the copies of the book from Tate, actually, in the exhibition as well. Um, but yeah, this is a, an exhibition, um, an install shot from the exhibition. And actually, these are several pages from the book. So you can come to the show and read some of those texts that I've referred to um, in the exhibition itself. Okay. Terrific. OK, thank you very much, Lottie. Thank you very thanks, much Sammy. for coming. And of course, thanks to the Tate Lates team and everyone for being able to put on this event. Uh, and thank you, all of you, for coming. <laughs> thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs>